This is a book. The glorious insanities of the English language mean that you can do all sorts of odd and demeaning things to a book. You can cook it, you can bring a criminal to it, or if the criminal refuses to be brought, you can throw it at him. You may even take a leaf out of it, the price of laboratory paper being what it is. But there's one thing you can never do to a book like this. Try as and how you might, you cannot turn up for it because a turn up for the books has nothing directly to do with the ink, glue and paper affair that this is. It's a turn up for the bookmakers. Any child who sees the bookmakers facing the bookshop across the high street will draw the seemingly logical conclusion. And a bookmaker was once simply someone who stuck books together. Indeed, the term bookmaker used to be used to describe the kind of writer who just pumps out one shelf filler after another with no regard for the exhaustion of the reading public. Thomas More observed in 1533 that of new bookmakers there are now more than enough. Luckily for the book trade, More was beheaded a couple of years later. The modern sense of the bookmaker as a man who takes bets originated on the racecourses of Victorian Britain. The bookmaker would accept bets from anyone who wanted to lay them and note them all down in a big betting book. Meanwhile, a turn-up was just a happy chance. A dictionary of slang from 1873 thoughtfully gives us this definition, turn-up, an unexpected slice of luck. Among sporting men, bookmakers are said to have a turn up when an unbacked horse wins. So, which horses are unbacked? Those are the best, i.e. the longest odds. Almost nobody backs a horse at 1,000 to 1. This may seem a rather counterintuitive answer. Odds of 1,000 to 1 are enough to tempt even a saint to stake his halo. But that's because saints don't know anything about gambling and horse flesh. Thousand to one shots never, ever come in. Every experienced gambler knows that a race is very often won by the favourite, which will, of course, have short odds. Indeed, punters want to back a horse that's so far ahead of the field, he merely needs to be shooed over the line. Such a horse is a shoe in So you pick the favourite, and you back it. Nobody but a fool backs a horse that's unlikely to win, so when an unfancied nag romps home over the finish line, it's a turn up for the books, because the bookies won't have to pay out. Not that the bookmakers need much luck, they always win. There will always be many more bankrupt gamblers than bookies. You're much better off in a zero-sum game, where the players pool their money and the winner takes all. Pooling your money began in France and has nothing whatsoever to do with swimming pools and a lot to do with chickens and genetics. A game of chicken. Gambling in medieval France was a simple business. All you needed were some friends, a pot and a chicken. In fact, you didn't need friends. You could do this with your enemies, but the pot and the chicken were essential. First, each person puts an equal amount of money in the pot. Nobody should, on any account, make a joke about paltry sum. Shoot the chicken away to a reasonable distance. What's a reasonable distance? About a stone's throw. Next, pick up a stone. Now, you all take turns hurling stones at that poor bird, which will squawk and flap and run about. The first person to hit the chicken wins all the money in the pot. You then agree never to mention any of this to an animal rights campaigner. And that's how the French played a game of chicken. The French, though being French, called it a game of pool, which is French for chicken. And the chap who had won all the money had therefore won the jeu de poule. The term got transferred to other things. At card games, the pot of money in the middle of the table came to be known as the pool. English gamblers picked the term up brought it back with them in the 17th century. They changed the spelling to pool, but they still had a pool of money in the middle of the table. It should be noted 
that this pool of money has absolutely nothing to do with a body of water. Swimming pools, rock pools, liver pools are utterly different things. Back to gambling. When billiards became a popular sport, people started to gamble on it, and this variation was known as pool, hence shooting pool. Then finally that poor French chicken broke free from the world of gambling and soared majestically out into the clear air beyond. And on the basis that gamblers pooled their money, people started to pool their resources, even pool their cars in a carpool. Then they pooled their typists in a typing pool. The chicken was free, and then he grew bigger than any of us, because since the phrase was invented in 1941, we've all become part of the gene pool, which etymologically means that we are all little bits of chicken. Hydro gentlemanly. The gene of gene pool comes all the way from the ancient Greek word genos, which means birth. It's the root that you find in generation, regeneration and degeneration. And along with its Latin cousin, genus, it's scattered generously throughout the English language, often in places where you wouldn't expect it. Take generous. The word originally meant well-born. And because it was obvious that well-bred people were magnanimous and peasants were stingy, it came to mean munificent. Indeed, the well-bred gentleman established such a reputation for himself that the word gentle, meaning soft, was named after him. In fact, some gentlemen became so refined that the gin in gingerly is probably just another gen lurking in our language. Gingerly certainly has nothing to do with ginger. Genus is hidden away in the very air you breathe. The chemists of the late 18th century had an awful lot of trouble with the gases that make up the air. Oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen and the rest all look exactly alike. They're transparent. They are effectively weightless. The only real difference anybody could find between them was their effects. What we now call oxygen makes things burn, while nitrogen puts them out. Scientists spent a lot of time separating the different kinds of air and then had to decide what to call them all. Oxygen was called flammable air for a while, but it didn't catch on. It just didn't have the right scientific ring to it. We all know that scientific words need an obscure classic origin to make them sound impressive to those who wouldn't know an idiopathic craniofacial erythema if it hit them in the face. Eventually, a Frenchman named Lavoisier decided that the sort of air that produced water when it burnt should be called the water producer. Being a scientist, he of course dressed this up in Greek, and the Greek for water producer is hydrogen. The bit of air that makes things acidic he decided to call the acid maker, or oxygen. And the one that produced nitre, then he got called nitrogen. Argon, the other major gas in air, wasn't known about at the time because it's an inert gas. It doesn't produce anything at all. That's why it's called argon. Argon is Greek for lazy. Most of the productive and reproductive things in the world have gen hidden somewhere in their names. All words are not homogeneous, and sometimes they are engendered in odd ways. For example, a group of things that reproduce is a genus. And if you're talking about a whole genus, then you're speaking in general. And if you're in general command of the troops, you are a general, and a general can order his troops to commit genocide, which etymologically would be suicide. Of course, a general won't commit genocide himself. He'll probably assign the job to his privates. And privates is a euphemism for gonads, which comes from exactly the same root for reasons that should be too obvious to need explaining. The Old and New Testicle? Gonads are testicles, 
and testicles shouldn't really have anything to do with the Old and New Testaments, but they do. The Testaments of the Bible testify to God's truth. This is because the Latin for witness was testis. From that one root, testis, English has inherited protest, bear witness for, detest, bear witness against, contest, bear witness competitively, and testicle. And what are testicles doing there? They are testifying to a man's virility. Do you want to prove that you're a real man? Well, your testicles will testify in your favour. That's the usual explanation anyway. There's another, more interesting theory that in bygone days, witnesses used to swear to things with their hands on their balls or even on other people's balls. In the book of Genesis, Abraham makes his servant swear not to marry his son to a Canaanite girl. The King James Version has this translation. I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, that I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth. Now, that may be a correct translation, but the Hebrew doesn't say thigh, it says yarek, which means approximately soft bits. Nobody knows how oaths were sworn in the ancient world, but many scholars believe that people didn't put their hands on their hearts or on their thighs, but on the testicles of the man to whom they were swearing, which would make the connection between testis and testes rather more direct. Testicles, bollocks, balls, nuts, cullions, cojones, ghoulies, tallywags, twiddle-diddles, baubles, trinkets, spermaria. There are a hundred words for the danglers and they get everywhere. It's enough to make a respectable fellow blush. Do you enjoy the taste of avocado? So did I until the terrible day when I realised that I was eating Aztec balls. You see, Aztecs noticed the avocado shape and decided that it resembled nothing so much as a great green bollock. So they called it ahuacatl, their word for testicle. When the Spanish arrived, they misheard this slightly and called it aguacate. And the English changed this slightly to avocado. To remember that I used to like avocados with a touch of walnut oil only adds to my shame. Even if you flee to an ivory tower and sit there wearing an orchid and a scowl, it still means that you have your testicle in your buttonhole because that's what an orchid's root resembles. And orchis was the Greek word for testicle. Indeed, the green-winged orchid used to rejoice in the name fool's bollocks. The technical term for somebody who has a lot of balls is polyorchid. And it's very possible that this orb, on which we all live, comes from the same root as orchid, in which case we are whirling around the sun on a giant testis, six billion trillion tons of gonad or cod, which is where cod philosophy, cod's wallop and cod piece come from. There are two cod pieces at the top right of your computer keyboard, and how they got there is a rather odd story. Parenthetical cod pieces. Your computer keyboard contains two pictures of cod pieces, and it's all the fault of the ancient Gauls, the original inhabitants of France. Gauls spoke Gaulish until Julius Caesar came and cut them all into three parts. One of the Gaulish words that the Gauls used to speak was braca, meaning trousers. The Romans didn't have a word for trousers because they all wore togas, and that's why the Gaulish term survived. From braca came the early French brag, meaning trousers. And when they wanted a word for codpiece, they decided to call it a braguette, or little trousers. This is not to be confused with a, a baguette, meaning a stick. In fact, a Frenchman might brag that his baguette was too big for his braguette, but then Frenchmen will claim anything. They're braggarts, literally meaning one who shows off his codpiece. 
Braguettes were much more important in the olden days, especially in armour, on the medieval battlefield with arrows flying hither and thither. A knight knew where he wanted the most protection. Henry VIII's cod piece, for example, was a gargantuan combination of efficiency and obscenity. It was big enough and shiny enough to frighten any enemy into disorganised retreat. It bulged out from the royal groin and stretched up to a metal plate that protected the royal belly. And that is significant. What do you call the bit of stone that bulges out from a pillar to support a balcony or a roof? Until the 16th century, nobody had been certain what to call them. But one day, somebody must have been gazing at the cathedral wall and in a moment of sudden clarity, realised that the architectural supports looked like nothing so much as Henry VIII's groin. And so such architectural structures came to be known as braggots. That brings us to Pocahontas. Pocahontas was a princess of the Powhatan tribe, which lived in Virginia. Of course, the Powhatan tribe didn't know they lived in Virginia. They thought they lived in Tenacomaca. So the English thoughtfully came with guns to explain their mistake. But the Powhatan tribe were obstinate and went so far as to take one Englishman prisoner. They were planning to kill him until Pocahontas intervened with their father and Captain John Smith was freed. The story goes that she had fallen madly in love with him and that they had a passionate affair. But as Pocahontas was only 10 years old at the time, we should probably move swiftly on. Of course, it may not have happened exactly that way. The story has been improved beyond repair, but there definitely was a Pocahontas and there definitely was a Captain John Smith and they seem to have been rather fond of each other. And then he had an accident with one of his guns and had to return to England. The cruel colonists told Pocahontas that John Smith was dead and she pined away in tears, thinking that he was lost forever. In fact, he wasn't dead. He was writing a dictionary. The Seaman's Grammar and Dictionary explaining all the difficult terms of navigation. It hit the bookstands in 1627. It had all sorts of nautical jargon for the aspiring sailor to learn. But for our story, the important thing is that Captain Smith spelt braggots as brackets and the spelling stuck. The original architectural device was called a braggot bracket because it looked like a codpiece. But what about a double bracket which connects two horizontals to a vertical? An architectural double bracket looks like a square bracket. Look around you, there's, there's probably one on the nearest bookshelf. And just as a physical bracket got its name because it resembled a codpiece, so the punctuation bracket got its name because it resembled the structural component. In 1711, a man called William Whiston published a book called Primitive Christianity Revived. The book often quotes from Greek sources, and when it does, it gives both Whiston's translation and the original, in which he was the first man to call brackets, brackets. And that's why if you look at the top right-hand corner of your computer keyboard, you'll see two little codpieces, square brackets, lingering obscenely beside the letter P for pants. Suffering from my underwear? Once upon a time, there was a chap who probably didn't exist and who probably wasn't called Pantaleon. Legend has it that he was personal physician to Emperor Maximus. When the Emperor discovered that his doctor was a Christian, he got terribly upset and decreed that the doctor should die. The execution went badly. They tried to burn him alive, but the fire went out. They threw him into molten lead, but it turned out to be cold. They lashed a stone to him and chucked him into the sea, but the stone floated. They threw him to wild beasts, which were tamed. They tried to hang him, and the rope broke. They tried to chop his head off, but the sword bent, and he forgave the executioner. This last kindness was what earned the doctor the name Pantaleon, which means 
all compassionate. In the end, they got Pantaleon's head off and he died, thus becoming one of the megalomartyrs, the great martyrs of Greece. By the 10th century, Saint Pantaleon had become the patron saint of Venice. Pantalon therefore became a popular Venetian name and the Venetians themselves were often called the Pantaloni. Then, in the 16th century, came the Commedia dell'arte, short comic plays performed by travelling troops and always involving the same stock characters like Harlequin and Scaramouche. In these plays, Pantaloni was the stereotypical Venetian. He was a merchant and a miser and a lustful old man and he wore one-piece breeches like Venetians did. These long breeches therefore became known as pantaloons. Pantaloons were short to pants and the English, though not the Americans, called their underwear underpants. Underpants were again shortened to pants, which is what I'm now wearing. Pants are all compassionate. Pants are saints. This means that my underwear is named after an early Christian martyr. Pans. So pants and panties come from Saint Pantaleon and your undies are all compassionate and your small clothes are martyred. Saint Pantaleon was therefore a linguistic relation of Saint Pancras, who held everything and Pandora, who was given everything in a box she really shouldn't have opened. Pan is one of those elements that gets everywhere. It's pan present. For example, when a film camera pans across from one face to another, that pan comes from the same Greek word that you'll find in your underpants. Cinematic panning is short for the panoramic camera, which was patented back in 1868 and so called because a panorama is where you see everything. A panacea cures absolutely everything, which is useful if you're in the middle of a pandemic, which is one up from an epidemic. An epidemic is only among the people, whereas a pandemic means all the peoples of the world are infected. Pan also gives you all sorts of terribly useful words that for some reason loiter in the dark and musty corners of the dictionary. Pantophobia, for example, is the granddaddy of all phobias, as it means a morbid fear of absolutely everything. Pantophobia is the inevitable outcome of pandiabolism, the belief that the devil runs the world, and in its milder forms is a panpathy or one of those feelings everybody has now and then. However, not all pans mean all. It's one of the great problems of etymology that there are no hard and fast rules. Nothing is pan applicable. The pans and pots in your kitchen have nothing whatsoever to do with panoramas or pan-Africanism. Panic is not a fear of everything. It is in fact the terror that the Greek god Pan, who rules the forests, is able to induce in anybody who takes a walk in the woods after dark. And the Greek god Pan is not panipotent. Nobody knows where his name comes from. All we're sure of is he played the panpipes. Back in 27 BC, the Roman general Marcus Agrippa built a big temple on the edge of Rome and in a fit of indecision decided to dedicate it to all the gods at once. 600 years later, the building was still standing and the Pope decided to turn it into a Christian church dedicated to St. Mary and the Martyrs. 1400 years after that, it's still standing and still has its original roof. Technically, it's now called the Church of St. Mary, but the tourists still call it the Pantheon or All the Gods. The exact opposite of the Pantheon is Pandemonium, the place of all the demons. These days, pandemonium is just a word we use to mean that everything is a bit chaotic, but originally it was a particular place in hell. It was one of the hundreds of English words that were invented by John Milton. Miltonic meanders. 
a boring commentary in ten books of meandering verse on the first chapter of Genesis is how Voltaire described Paradise Lost, the great epic poem by John Milton. Voltaire was wrong, of course. Paradise Lost is mainly about Adam and Eve and that pomarvorous couple don't actually appear until the second chapter of the book of Genesis. Paradise Lost is all about the fall of Satan from heaven and the fall of humanity from the Garden of Eden into the land of Nod, which is generally speaking a downhill poem. However, it's still the greatest epic in English, an achievement that's largely due to its being almost the only epic in English that anybody's ever bothered writing, and certainly the only one that anyone has bothered ever reading. So it's also the origin of pandemonium. In Milton's poem, when Satan is thrown out of heaven and into hell, the first thing he decides to do is to get a roof over his head. So he summons all the other fallen angels and gets them to build a huge and hideous palace. And just as the Pantheon is the temple of all the gods, so Satan decides to name his new pied -à terre all the demons or pandemonium. And that's how the word was invented. Of course, since then, pandemonium has become to mean anything that's a bit noisy. It all goes back to Milton's idea and his fondness for inventing language. Milton adored inventing words, and he couldn't find the right term. He just made one up. Impassive, obtrusive, jubilant, loquacious, unconvincing, satanic, persona, fragrance, beleaguered, sensuous, undesirable, disregard, damp, criticise, irresponsible, lovelorn, exhilarating, sectarian, unaccountable, incidental, and cooking. All Milton's. When it came to inventive wording, Milton actually invented the word wording. Or struck? Well, he invented that one too, along with stunning and terrific. And because he was a Puritan, he invented words for all the fun things of which he disapproved. Without dear old Milton, we'd have no debauchery, no depravity, no extravagance. In fact, nothing enjoyable at all. Poor preachers. People always take their condemnations as suggestions. One man's abomination is another's jolly good idea. This is the law of unintended consequences, and yes... Milton invented the word unintended. He probably didn't intend or imagine that one of his obscure words would, as, would end up as the title for this book. Etymologicon, meaning a book containing etymologies, first crops up in his essay on nullities in marriage. Whether you're all ears or obliviously tripping the light fantastic, you're still quoting Milton, Trip as ye go on the light fantastic toe is from his poem L'Allegro. In a light fantastic round and all ear are from his play Comus. When a tennis player has an advantage, that's Milton's too. Or at least he invented advantage in its sporting sense. When all hell breaks loose, that's paradise lost. Because when Satan escapes from hell, a curious angel asks him, Wherefore with thee came not all hell broke loose? We rely on Milton. For example, he invented space travel, or at least made it linguistically possible. The word space had been around for centuries, but it was Milton who first applied it to the vast, vast voids between the stars. Satan comforts his fallen angels by telling them that though they have been banned from heaven, space may produce new worlds. And that's why we don't have outer distance or void stations or expanse ships. Because of Milton, we have 2001 A Space Odyssey and David Bowie's song Space Oddity. Indeed, if there were any justice in pop music, John Milton would be raking in his royalties from Jeff Beck's hi-ho silver lining because Milton invented silver linings. Was I deceived, or did a sable sound turn forth her silver lining on the night? 
This chapter is becoming rather quotationist, which is one of Milton's words that didn't catch on, so let's proceed to pastures new. At last he rose and twitched his mantle blue, tomorrow to fresh woods and pastures new. Let's forget about the silver linings and concentrate on the clouds. Bloody typical semantic shifts. Do you know the difference between the clouds and the sky? If you do, you're lucky, because if you live in England, the two are pretty much synonymous. The clouds aren't lined with silver. The weather is just miserable. It always has been, and it always will be. Our word sky comes from the Viking word for cloud. But in England, there's simply no difference between the two concepts. And so the word changes its meaning because of the awful weather. So that if there's one thing that etymology proves conclusively, it's the, the world is a wretched place. We may dream of better things, but the word dream comes from the Anglo-Saxon for happiness. And there's a moral in that. It's always rained. Happiness has always been a dream. And people have always been lazy. Well, I should know. I'm lazy myself. Ask me to do something like the washing up or a tax return and I'll reply I'll do it in, in five minutes. Five minutes usually means never. If the task I've been assigned is absolutely essential for my survival, then I might say I'll do it in a minute, which usually means within an hour, but I'm not guaranteeing anything. Do not condemn me. Remember that a moment is the smallest conceivable amount of time. Now, turn on the radio or the television and wait. Soon enough an announcer will come on and say that in a moment we'll be showing this, that or the other, but first the news and weather. There's an old pop song by the Smiths called How Soon Is Now. The writers of the song must have been even lazier than I am because the answer is available in any etymological dictionary. Soon was the Anglo-Saxon word for now. It's just that after a thousand years of people saying, I'll do that soon, soon has ended up meeting, meaning what it does today. These days, now has to have a right stuck on the front of it, or it doesn't mean a thing. The same happened to the word anon. Not the shortening of anonymous, but the synonym, synonym for soon. It derives from the old English phrase on an, which meant on one or instantly. But humans don't do things instantly, we just promise to. And the word instantly will, of course, go the way of its siblings. And people are nasty, condemnatory beings. The way people overstate the faults of others is frankly demonic. There's a lovely bit in King Lear where the Duke of Gloucester is having his eyes gouged out by Regan and responds by calling her a naughty lady. Naughty used to be a much more serious word than it is now, but it has been overused and lost its power. So many stern parents have called their children naughty that the power has slowly drained from the word. If you were naughty, it used to mean that you were no human. It comes from exactly the same root as naught or nothing. Now it just means that you're mischievous. Every weakness of human nature comes out in the history of etymology. Probably the most damning word is probably. 2,000 years, years ago, the Romans had the word probabilis. If something was probabilis, then it could be proved by experiment because the two words came from the same root, probare. But probabilis got overused. People are always more certain of things than they really should be, and that applied to the Romans just as much as to us. Roman lawyers would claim that their case was probabilis when it wasn't. Roman astrologers would say that their predictions were probabilis when they weren't. And absolutely any sane Roman would tell you that it was probabilis that the sun went round the earth. So by the time poor probably first turned up in English in 1387, it was already a poor, exhausted word whose best days were behind it. 
and it only meant likely. Now if probable comes from the same root as prove, can you guess why the proof of the pudding is in the eating? The proof of the pudding. As we've seen, both probable and prove come from a single Latin root probare. And while probable has, through overuse, come to mean only likely, prove has prospered and its meaning has grown stronger than it ever used to be. However, you can still see its humble origins in a few phrases that don't seem to make sense anymore. Why would an exception prove the rule? And why do you have a proofreader? What happens on a proving ground that's so very definitive? And what kind of rigorous philosopher would require proof of a pudding? The answer to all these can be found in that old Latin root, probare. Despite what was said in the last section, probare didn't exactly mean prove in our modern English sense, but it meant something very close. What the Romans did to their theories was to test them. Sometimes a theory would be tried and tested and found to work. Other times a theory would be tried and tested and found wanting. That's the same thing that happens to a book when it's sent to the proofreader. What the proofreader gets is a proof copy, which he pours over trying to find misspellings and unnecessary apostrophes. That's also why an exception really does prove a rule. The exception is what puts a rule to the test. That test may destroy it, or the rule may be tested and survive. But either way, the theory has been proved. Similarly, when a new weapon is taken to the proving ground, it's not just to make sure that it exists. The proving ground is a place where a weapon can be tested to make sure that it is as deadly as had been hoped. All of which should explain why the test of a good dessert and the proof of a pudding is in the eating. It's the old sense of prove. Mind you, you probably wouldn't have wanted to prove old puddings. A pudding was originally the entrails of an animal stuffed with its own meat and grease, boiled and stuck in a cupboard for later. One of the earliest recorded uses of the word is in a medieval recipe from 1450 for porpoise pudding. Pudding of porpoise. Take the blood of him and the grease of himself and oatmeal and salt and pepper and ginger and mel these together well and then put this in the gut of the porpoise and then let it seethe easily and not hard a good while and then take him up and broil him a little and then serve forth. The proof of porpoise pudding would definitely be in the eating. A pudding was effectively just a strange and possibly poisonous kind of sausage. Now, before the next link in the chain, can you take a guess as to why glamorous people put sausage poison on their faces? Sausage poison in your face. The Latin word for sausage was botulus, from which English gets two words. One of them is the lovely botuliform, which means sausage shaped and is a more useful word than you might think. The other word is botulism. Sausages may taste lovely, but it's usually best not to ask what's actually in them. Curiosity may have killed the cat, but it was a sausage maker who disposed of the body. In 19th century America, the belief that sausages were usually made out of dog meat was so widespread that they started to be called hot dogs, a word that survives to this day. Sausages are stuffed with pork and peril. They don't usually kill you, but they can. There was an early 19th century German called Justinus Kerner, who, when not writing rather dreary Schwabian poetry, worked as a doctor. His poetry is now quite justifiably forgotten, but his medical work lives on. Kerner identified a new disease that killed some of his patients. It was a horrible malady that slowly paralysed every part of the body until the victim's heart stopped and died. Kerner realised that all his dead patients had been eating cheap meat in sausages, 
so he decided to call the ailment botulism or sausage disease. He also correctly deduced that bad sausages must contain a poison of some sort, which he called botulinum toxin. In 1895 there was a funeral in Belgium. Ham was served to the guests at the wake and three of them dropped down dead. This must have delighted the undertakers, but it also meant that the remaining meat could be rushed to the University of Ghent. The professor of bacteria studied the homicidal ham under a microscope and finally identified the culprit. Little bacteria that were appropriately shaped like sausages and are now called Clostridium botulinum. This was an advance because it meant that Kerner's botulinum toxin could be manufactured. Now you might be wondering why anybody would want to manufacture botulinum toxin. It is, after all, a poison. In fact, one microgram of it will cause near instantaneous death by paralysis. But paralysis can sometimes be a good thing. If, for example, you're afflicted by facial spasms, then a doctor can inject a teensy weensy little dose of botulinum toxin into the affected area. A little temporary paralysis kicks in and the spasms are cured. Wonderful. That at least was the original reason for manufacturing botulinum toxin. But very quickly people discovered that if you paralyse somebody's face, you made them look a little bit younger also make them look very odd and incapable of expressing emotion but who cares about that if you can remove a few years worth of aging suddenly sausage poison was chic the rich and famous couldn't get enough sausage poison it could extend a hollywood actress's career by years old ladies could look middle-aged again injections of kerner's sausage poison were like plastic surgery but less painful and less permanent Sausage poison became the toast of Hollywood. Of course, it's not called sausage poison anymore. That wouldn't be very glamorous. It's not even called botulinum toxin because everybody knows that toxins are bad for you. Now that botulinum toxin has become chic, it's changed its name to Botox. So if Botox is sausage poison and toxicology is the study of poison and intoxication is poisoning, what does toxophilite mean?